Perry Marshall. I'm here with a very interesting gentleman, Gerald Pollack, and he is a water researcher at the University of Washington. Um, he was introduced to me by Karen Parker, and there are several other friends uh, for the last few years have been mentioning his work to me. And I already had his book, um, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And that's one of his books. There's, there's others as well. And um, it turns out that there are relatively few people who are treating water as something that we do not completely understand. Um, uh, a, a lot of people kind of operate like, well, you know, I, I've understood water since my eighth grade biology or, you know, science book that said, well, it's, it's H and two O's and like, there you go. And it's got the electron orbits and like, that's kind of it. And uh, Gerald Pollack has had a position that, well, there's a lot more to water than just that. And it has some very special characteristics. It has a fourth phase. And so I thought it would be wonderful to bring Gerald on. We uh, met a few months ago, had a wonderful conversation, and I just wanted to keep this going. So Gerald Pollack, welcome. Glad oh, thank here. you, Perry. I'm delighted, delighted to be with you and uh, delighted to have an opportunity to uh, discuss the, the findings uh, that we've, we've come upon and its implications, directed by your questions. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, so just give us a little preview of, of, of some of what we're going to talk about. Um, help us understand, um, you know, most people think that water has three phases, ice, liquid, and gas, um, uh, steam. Uh, but uh, you say that water has a fourth phase and that water has memory. And uh, can you give a, a little... Uh, kind of an overview of you know, you've been doing this for a very long time and discovered many interesting things. What like what's the tip of the iceberg here, uh, and, and where does it seem to be pointing? Uh, the, usually, iceberg tips point up, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know uh, perhaps that's the direction it, it, it it's pointing. But you know, for many years, uh, some scientists have thought, uh, no, uh, the idea that water has three phases can't be right because there are too many, too many features of water's behavior uh, that don't fit. You can't explain. And, um, and these are actually listed now on a website. Um, uh, uh, um, um, and and uh, uh, there are now, I think, 65 or so uh, features, behaviors of water that don't fit the idea of, uh, of, of three phases. And some rather distinguished scientists have been also involved in, in, in thinking or collecting data, suggesting that there's something beyond. And one of those, one of those is um, Albert St. Georgie, uh, who was a Nobel laureate for his work on vitamin C. But uh, uh, a scientist who thought broadly about so, so many issues. And among his famous quotes, one of them is, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. So he knew, mm -hmm. he knew there was more um, to water than just as, as many b biologists were, were, were thinking that water is just sort of like the bathtub into which we bathe ourselves. It's just a background carrier of the more important molecules of life. And he knew otherwise. And so did others, including uh, the late Gilbert Ling, who basically spent his life suggesting that inside the cell, uh, that water is different, uh, that somehow the water is ordered, the molecules are, are, are lined up. And that's where we took our cue. It was mainly uh, from, from Gilbert Ling. Um, and the first thing we, we did, the first thing I did was to write a book, the book that you flashed up, uh, Sales, Gels, and the Engines of Life. And the purpose of that book was um, to make the ideas of Gilbert Ling more accessible to ordinary humans um, mm -hmm. rather than superhumans. Um, it's a very accessible book with really great drawings and 
fantastic explanations. So I well, thank you. I I appreciate that um, a kind comment. I of course I tried and. Um, because I did want to make it accessible, and and it, you know it received mixed reviews. Um, I didn't go into that. Some of the people thought, "Oh, this is just more of Gilbert Ling, and we know that Ling is a crackpot, so don't even bother opening it." Um, you know. So anyway, that. Uh, um, so what what is what we call the the fourth phase? Well, it it, it resembles a bit what Gilbert Ling had been talking about, but. But uh, it differs in some in some fundamental ways, and we've been studying it now for two decades. Um, actually, I was in a different field early on. I was in the field of muscle contraction and how how muscles contract at the molecular level. But this seems so important, uh, so critically important, because if Gilbert Ling was right or almost right, it meant that essentially all of biology um, had to, to be recast in a, a, a different framework because of water, you know, if water is not critical, then you've got one framework. And if water is critical, you've got a different framework. And, um, and the, the latter framework is the one uh, our experiments have demonstrated is correct. So, okay, so what is the, the, the fourth phase? And um, so let me just tell you, I, I guess the best way to tell you is, is to, um, to tell you the experiments that we did and, and what we found because they reveal right away a few of the, the main, main characteristics. So we took some water uh, with little particles sitting in the water. Uh, the particles are, uh, we've used many different types, but typically microspheres, little tiny spheres, suspended in the water. And we put into the water, we immersed a gel. Uh, with the first one we use, we've used many, but is polyvinyl alcohol gel. And we looked in the microscope to see uh, what happened. And what happened uh, was astonishing that next to the gel surface where you'd find water and microspheres, the microspheres uh, migrated and we could see it in real time. We could see the microspheres migrating away from the surface, leaving uh, a zone where they were excluded. Uh, so we, by the way, call this the exclusion zone because it, it kind of made sense. And, and we thought at the time, uh, you know, why would the microspheres um, get excluded? And we thought one possibility at the time, we weren't sure by any means, but one possibility was, is what Gilbert Ling and St. Georgie and others were talking about, that the water molecules somehow might be organized because if the water molecules are like a crystal uh, organized, crystals tend to exclude impurities. Otherwise, they wouldn't be pure. You see, so, so we thought maybe what's going on is is, is this a, a zone of ordered water, structured water, as it it was once called, is building uh, from the water molecules. Is building right next to the gel uh, surface. So, we did uh, many experiments uh, um, on this, and we found that the properties uh, of this zone are completely and vastly uh, different from the properties of ordinary water. So I'll, ju I'll just mention a couple of the main features which are significant in, in everything that follows. And one of them is that th this zone, the water that's inside the zone, the EZ water, um, exclusion zone, EZ, easy to remember, um, uh, uh, that, that we stuck an electrode in and we found that they're not neutral. Uh, these zones are typically, they're negatively charged. And then we thought, well, you know, that's interesting. Uh, it's negatively charged, but if it originates from water molecules, the water molecules are neutral. So <laughs> if the zone is negatively charged, what happened to the complementary positive charges? And we found that they were actually in the water beyond the zone of exclusion. So you had a negative zone next to a positive zone. And of course, it occurred to us that, you know, if you've got separated negative and positive, um, that's a battery. Um, and we indeed, we stuck electrodes, one electrode in the negative, one electrode in the positive, and we could, we could light um, an LED. Uh, we could get light coming out of that, as we might expect from, from a battery. 
and then the next question that arose, which again is, is ra rather fundamental, is you can't get something for nothing, right? You can't get a light bulb without putting energy in. You're getting energy out, uh, you know. Uh, so where did the energy come from? <coughs> we couldn't figure it out. Uh, we spent a couple of years. So just, just I want to make sure. So you put microspheres, <laughs> sometimes they were made of PVA, sometimes they were made of something else. But you put them in this water and you saw that what near the sphere, the water was negatively charged. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I I I I wasn't clear. We 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 put um a gel, a block of gel in the water. Okay. And 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 uh we found that next to the surface of this gel, those microspheres were getting excluded. Uh, okay. So there are, the, the microspheres are simple markers. They're tiny little markers and you could use almost anything you put on any uh, kind of particles. It doesn't matter. We've used many. It's just, it's simple to use. So the microspheres are only markers. So you got this negatively charged zone uh, and next to it are positive charges. You get energy. Where, do, where does the input energy uh, come to create, to charge the battery uh, effectively? Where does it come? And, and finally, by virtue of a, a clever student uh, who was doing what he was not supposed to be doing, <laughs> uh, um, he found it was light. And um, it's no surprise, you know, uh, because if, you know, if you know the photosynthetic process, plants get their energy from light. And step one in the photosynthetic process Step one is light coming in and separating water into plus and minus. That's pretty much the same as, as what we, we discovered. So, and, and it, it, it turns out that um, for, for reasons, I, I, it's too much to, to go into, but it's possible that what we found is a, a generic, uh, you might say a generic first step of photosynthesis. The process could be, much the same and the actual photosynthetic process is is one that nature has perfected uh, to be for example 100 percent efficient and uh, etc and 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 ours is a more generic version of that that is perhaps uh, less less efficient so okay uh so those are those are the principal features um uh of what i'm talking about and and there are applications, but I, 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 I want to follow your lead. And so you can um, ask me a direction that you would like to go. <laughs> so why don't you list off some different applications? And then we could pick from the list and, and see where that takes us. Okay. But why would this be significant and, and useful? For many reasons. Uh, uh, the, the one that's perhaps received... Um, the most attention is in health. Um, because um, as Gilbert Ling demonstrated, this kind of structured, we say easy or fourth phase water, it fills our cells. Um, and, and as I uh, deduced in that book that you flashed, the cells, gels, and the engines of life, it plays, this kind of water uh, plays a central role in, in virtually every process that the cell undergoes. And you know, this, this is not mainstream understanding at all. It deviates markedly from, from that, but um, the evidence suggests that, that it's true. So you've got this water that fills the cell and it participates in what the cell does. And you can imagine um, um, to be succinct uh, that if you don't have enough of this stuff in your cell for whatever reason, if the cell is dehydrated, the cell is not going to work properly. It's gonna be dysfunctional or even pathological. So. Mm -hmm. So it's attracted um, a, a good deal of attention, uh, attention from, from health-oriented uh, people, especially those who are, maybe you might say, out of the mainstream, who, who are thinking uh, um, um, deeply about how, how cells work and how they can be kept healthy. So one of the things that's emerged from that, um, from our results and results of, uh, of, of some others, what you really need to do is make sure that you're well hydrated. Um, and there are, there are uh, certain ways of doing that, which I, uh, simple ways, which I can go into, but, but I, I just wanna 
finish um, answering your question. So, so this is one of the areas um, that, that's important. Uh, another um, area is the area of filtration. Um, so as everybody knows, the, the waters are increasingly polluted with, um, well, you know, pharmaceuticals that are discarded and uh, microplastics uh, and the list, the list goes on. And of course, what you wanna do is, is get rid of all that. And, and there are various filtration devices and, um, and out of the research that I've been talking about comes one filtration device that we call the filterless filter because there's no physical filter. Um, the, the principle is, is actually very simple. Um, you just collect the fourth phase water, which, which essentially, since it excludes contaminants, is basically free of, uh, of, of those contaminants. And, um, and in the laboratory, we, we demonstrated that it can work uh, really effectively. Uh, we, we can get in, in one pass through the device that we devised in the laboratory, we could get a 200 to one separation. In other words, eliminate some of these solutes very effectively. And the problem with that, um, uh, among the many problems, um, was that it, the throughput of, of this device was, was minuscule, you know, enough to satisfy the thirst of a flea. Um, and so we, we spent some time um, in development. We could increase the throughput um, by uh, a few orders of magnitude. Uh, and and we, we had been uh, pursuing that and we ran into a couple of uh, technical um, uh, issues, uh, which I could discuss later, but I, I don't want to get off track. Third one is to use the same method, uh, but to get rid of salt. And we started doing that as well, but we haven't made a lot of progress. So you can imagine um, right now, the way to get rid of uh, salt from water is through reverse osmosis. You know, and it's pretty effective, but um, it's costly. Uh, the amount of energy that you need to put into it is is enough. Uh, maybe if you live in Saudi Arabia, which is actually how the, how they get their drinking water almost completely because there are no other sources. Um, and um, so they depend on it uh, 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 critically. But um, what we, we could do this way, the possibility is to take ocean water, expose it to the sun, which is the source of light energy, uh, and get rid of the salt, separate it. And, and so this is what another area that we find really exciting um, to, to accomplish that because you know, uh, the places where the water is needed the most is, are the places where there's lots of, lots of sunlight and ample ocean um, access. So you've got the, the raw, the ingredients that you need. And it's just a matter of perfecting the technique. And in order to do that, more research is needed um, uh, because we're at preliminary stages. So that's a third, um, I think we're up to three. Uh, fourth one, is getting energy, uh, electrical energy from light and water, completely renewable. I mentioned earlier, it works in the laboratory, um, but as you know better than most people, um, going, going from a laboratory demonstration to a practical outcome requires um, a crossing the valley of death, <laughs> the abyss <laughs> where, you know, where many, many of these discoveries wind up. But anyway, um, that's another area of real importance. Um, so I, I, I can mention a, a, a couple of others that um, maybe have less import, but uh, people are, are working on, um, um, not us, but others. One is a guy who designs professional ice skating rinks. Mm. Um, and, you know, our discoveries uh, relate to ice as well because we found we found that if you want to freeze water, um, as we all do, uh, you know we get ice. But it turns out that um, easy water is a necessary intermediate. So you, you go from water, then you go to easy or fourth phase, and then you go to ice. And if you want to melt the ice, you go from ice to easy to ordinary water. And I showed in. In my uh, a book that came after the one that, that you showed, it's called The Fourth Phase of Water. 
I found, um, I reported in that book, experiments that we've done to confirm uh, all of that. And that excited a guy, um, a Finnish guy who builds Olympic ice skating rinks. And, um, and you know, obviously you want, you want the surface to be slick and um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he's taken up um, our observations and uh, our findings um, um, to to um, design his ice skating rinks with uh, with, with in increased knowledge and understanding and and using light in 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 a way that he now understands uh, can impact the surface of the ice. So that's another, and and um, yet another is an Italian guy um, who. Um, who um, who understands history very well, and and the and he was dealing or has been dealing with the ancient Romans and how they kept cool, um, and um, he's demonstrated that one of the ways that uh, to keep cool was to spray water on a ceramic surface, and what happens is that easy water builds, and um, easy water doesn't radiate um, um, nearly as 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 much infrared energy as as ordinary water so if you're sitting if you're sitting in a room um, and there's water um, you receive infrared energy or heat so to speak from that water and you feel warm but if you have a ceramic surface that orders the water and converts it to easy water there's much less we found much less um, uh, infrared radiation so if you're not receiving infrared radiation you don't feel hot anymore and that's the way he demonstrated the ancient Romans would keep cool. Um, it's just as usable today as, as then. So I've given you, you know, I've given you a half dozen uh, different, different areas, uh, any of which we can talk about, but you have a question I can see. So how do you think if, if, if I think that water is like liquid water is liquid water is liquid water. And I think ice is ice is ice and it's really not, um, then if I'm a cell biologist or a health practitioner, what am I in danger of overlooking? Uh, you're in danger of overlooking the existence uh, of this fourth phase or of easy water. And if you overlook it, um, you know, in essence, you do it at your own peril because if it's there, if it's real and you overlook it, then you're going to miss some salient points uh, that could help you in, 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 in being an effective health practitioner. Um, you know, it's like, it, it's like um, you're a mechanic dealing with a car and you, you open and there's a problem with the car and you, you open the hood, but but you haven't a clue how the machine works. You make some assumptions that are not not right, and and you're you know you might be able to repair it uh, uh, from experience or something. But if you know how it works, if you know the principles, that gives you a much better opportunity to to be effective in doing that. Um, I, so, I, I guess yeah. Go ahead. So are are there areas where people are already? Uh, they're already using this, but not knowing it. So like I, I noticed in your book, there was a section where it said, I think it was MRIs. I think you were saying that they, uh, they detect, like the way they detect cancer is that the water in a cancer cell is different than the water in a regular cell. Like, is that uh, one dimension of this issue? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the the entire the entire uh, MRI is is based on the structuring of water. If if all the water, you know, they're looking at the the protons uh, wiggling back and forth, and uh, the protons are most of them are in water, so they're effectively looking at water. And if all those if all the water was the same, they wouldn't get any image uh, from that. Um, so the the very existence of MRI of the, that of the imaging is based on <coughs> on on the existence of structured water and and some of the people especially the ones <coughs> who understand this uh, um, know know about that so it started it started with Ray Demadian uh, uh, he was a pathologist who came to the laboratory of the Gil same Gilbert Ling 
that I was talking about. And he thought that water structure uh, might be somehow related to pathology. And that led him eventually uh, to, to um, invent MRI. He, he's actually the inventor and uh, Ray, Ray Demadian. Um, he didn't get a Nobel Prize. Um, uh, three, I believe, people who did the, the mathematics underlying the uh, imaging got it. And the median uh, came forth with a, a full page ad in, uh, I think, New York Times or Washington Post, complaining that the Nobel Committee overlooked him because he was the inventor of the entire thing. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, that's a side story. But on the other hand, uh, you know, it, it, it's real. And, and possibly, I think he thinks that the reason that he was not chosen is uh, that he, he was one of the proponents of water structure. Uh, with with Gilbert Ling in whose laboratory uh, he 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 worked and um, so it's a sad story because um, you know those those of us who who think about justice and realize that he invented the entire thing uh, he should not have been over, overlooked in in that way but to get back to your question yeah the whole thing is based on the fact that um, water is structured and different regions have different structures and indeed. Uh, there have been reports that uh, cancer cells are lacking um, uh, uh, th this kind of structured water and could be a really important clue uh, as, as to the uh, genesis of cancer, uh, you know, that has not, not been given a lot of attention and perhaps it should. So if you're allowed to freely speculate with the understanding that you might be wrong, but speak freely anyway what do you think that fourth phase of water implies or could help us discover about detecting or even treating cancer yeah thank you for that question uh, so this has not been an area that in which we've immersed ourselves but but it's really important. Um, so if you, if you look at cancer from, from uh, the most fundamental basis, uh, it, what happens is the cell keeps dividing. Um, now, so how do cells ordinarily divide? Well, according to um, what I presented in that Cells, Gels, and the Engine of Life book, um, what happens is that um, the, the water structure that exists inside the cell, the water converts from, uh, I called it structured at the time because that was the prevailing, now I would call it fourth phase or easy since our discoveries. Um, uh, the water undergoes a transition that's a, a called a phase transition. It goes from structured to ordinary and then back to structured. And that transition is what triggers um, the cell to do what it does. And one of the things it does is it divides. And so when the, during the mitotic process, what was originally uh, easy water now is turned transiently uh, into ordinary water. And, and, and so the process, now, if you don't have enough easy water, if it, for some reason, you don't have enough in your cells, but, but uh, instead you have ordinary water, some of that transition has occurred, the cell will keep dividing. That's cancer. Um, and so, again, this is speculation. You asked me uh, to speculate. Um, if I were, if I were um, to tackle the problem of cancer, that's where I would start, uh, right at, at, at that basis. And, you know, as you know, the war against cancer has been fought now for like 50 years, approximately, starting with President Nixon. Yes, 50 years ago, December was December 21st was the anniversary, as a matter of fact. So that's that right. That's I, I, I had known that. Um, well, I heard that President Biden uh, has um, is going to be maybe if Congress approves tackling that issue in a different way. Um, you're familiar with DARPA. Um, no. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. And, branch. And, and so, right, and and DARPA has created so much because because of the way they they do things. Uh, what they have done in the past has changed a bit now. They've given free reign to their researchers. Follow your hunch, um, and that created the internet and uh, uh, many other discoveries. 
because scientists were free. Uh, now they're not free. They're constrained um, by the various granting organizations to follow the theme. And the cancer theme has been genetics almost uh, completely. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so, so if right. you have another idea about cancer, you're not going to get money or uh, the chances are very slim. Um, if you, for example, say something about water and cancer, you know, it's going to go to reviewers who, who think water, uh, you know, everything that could be known about water is already known. What, what is this crackpot suggesting about going in that direction? And, and so what I heard that President Biden wants to do is to create um, uh, something like DARPA or ARPA, it's called ARPA-H. And the idea is that ARPA-H will follow the same uh, kind of organizational theme as did DARPA and later ARPA. In other words, giving free reign to scientists, especially in the area of cancer, to follow their hunch. I mm. hope it's approved because I think that will make the difference. Anyway, that's my speculation. You told me um, to speculate freely. <laughs> and so sure. I'm there. Yeah. Now, um, somebody told me, and you confirmed, that there has been a huge pushback against this view of water, and it goes back quite a ways. Could you tell us some of that history and, and some of the controversies that have um, that have erupted in, in the, the opposition that has happened? Sure. Um, well, uh, it starts with uh, a guy named a Russian, uh, Boris Deryagin. And Boris Deryagin was considered to be uh, the premier physical chemist in all of Russia. And Russia had and has a lot of competent physical chemists, but he was number one. Um, and someone came to his laboratory and, uh, and showed him something uh, that really intrigued him. Um, it looked like a different, well, if you will, a different phase of water. And, um, and he, he, he examined that. And at first, it was purely in Russia because uh, the, the Russian stuff was not translated into English or German or anything. So the West didn't know about it. But it was the time of the Cold War. So Deryagin found that there was a kind of, um, or studied, premier physical chemist, a kind of water uh, that looked different from ordinary water and um, not so different from uh, what you might say a fourth phase. Uh, and the properties of that water were different from ordinary liquid water. The, the uh, uh, vaporization temperature was very high. The freezing temperature was very low. The density was different. Uh, basically, uh, essentially all of the physical chemical features. and. And then it got translated uh, in, into English. Um, and it was the time of the Cold War, you see. So we as Americans were taught, oh, the Russians, they have, they have no clue about science or anything else. They're evil, um, et cetera, <laughs> you know? And so it was received uh, in the West um, differently by different, different people. Uh, some of the scientists thought, oh yeah, maybe there's something to this. And other scientists thought, oh, the Russians, they're idiots, and we're going to prove them wrong. Remember yeah. the time of the Cold War. So at first, there was a really important article that appeared as a lead article in Science, and, you know, the premier, one of the premier journals, uh, Science. And the people studied this kind of water, and they gave it a name. They called it poly water. Poly, because it, the behavior looked like uh, a polymer. Behavior, so they call it poly water, meaning the water is somehow, somehow water molecules would group together uh, somehow, um, <coughs> not so different from what Gilbert Ling was was talking about and Saint Georgie. Uh, so it got to the West, and it gained a lot of recognition from from this science article, but there were others who said, ah, it can't be right, and they were set out to prove that it wasn't right and. And one group uh, said, oh, we did the same, same experiment and the whole thing can be explained by contaminants. Mm -hmm. And that didn't look good for Deryagin, but a lot of the Americans and people in the West wanted to believe it because after all, you know, we know everything there is to know about water and the Russians, by the way, are stupid. Uh, they don't know anything, so they must be wrong. And that got a lot of recognition. And then the nails in, uh, in the coffin, um, appeared 
from a group, I, I think Australian, um, and they put salt in the water and they made some measurements and they found uh, that some of the features of that salt water were similar to what the Russians had, had reported. And they concluded that the Russians must have been sweating into their solutions. Um, wow. And that, that, was, that was the killer, what, uh, sorry. But what was the real killer uh, was Deryagin himself. Two or three years later, he wrote a paper saying, all these critics are correct, we screwed up. Now, you think this, I, by the expression on your face, this doesn't make any sense. But I found out the reason for this. I interviewed two people who were really close to Deryagin uh, until the time of his death. Uh, one guy, the director of an institute, the neighboring building, who, um, who had uh, coffee or vodka or whatever with, with him uh, a few times a week. Uh, they lived in the same apartment complex. Um, and, and also someone who had been a, a postdoc working with Deryagin. They told me the same story independently. He was forced by the Russian government to recant. Uh, the Russians, wow. yeah, wow was right. Can you imagine, you know, um, a scientist, um, you know, he was given a choice. Either um, he, he will uh, continue his science somewhere in the gulag in, in Siberia, uh, or he can recant. And so he recanted. Um, but it, until the day he died, he believed he was correct. Well, and I'm not so sure. I think what he found probably is not so different from what we found. So that that's one. But the more colorful story was uh, the, that of a French scientist, Jacques Benveniste. Um, and he was an immunologist of great repute. Um, um, his findings appear in uh, immunology books and such. Um, and he was doing experiments where he takes some antibodies um, and expose some cells that are called basophils, uh, expose them to those antibodies. So he dumped the antibodies on the basophils and the basophils would secrete histamine. So antibodies, cells, uh, secretion. Uh, is. Some guy came to his lab and said, uh, you know, I can, I can achieve the same highly specific kind of um, secretory event as a secretion, even if I, uh, uh, if I take those antibodies and dilute and dilute and dilute the way homeopaths do. I think the guy was a homeopath and get the same result. And Jacques being um, a curious intellectual, uh, yeah, well, sure, demonstrate to us. There, there's a corner in the laboratory, a laboratory of 50 people. It's, it's vacant, go do your thing. Before long, the whole laboratory was there looking over this guy's shoulder. And indeed he could demonstrate exactly um, what he declared he could demonstrate. And so uh, Jacques decided this is important enough. The whole laboratory began uh, looking into this. Uh, this was important enough uh, that they're going to pursue it. And they did pursue it. And they found that, you know, this guy was right. And they decided to send a paper to Nature. Uh, again, um, a premier journal, perhaps the premier uh, journal. And they sent it to Nature and, um, and the editor, Sir John Maddox, uh, wrote back uh, a letter, which is, is in archives. Anybody can see and look at it, um, uh, ac along with other things I'll mention in a moment. And the letter said, um, uh, can't be right because if you're right, everybody else is wrong. And I refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong. Therefore, we're not even gonna send it to review. Mm. Okay, so you can imagine if you were in the place of Jacques, um, you know, you, you do this experiment and you get these results every time, not quite every time. Uh, they said, um, indeed, that uh, they saw it most of the time, but not every time, easily beyond a uh, question of statistical significance, but not every time. Um, and so receiving this feedback, um, you know, Jacques decided, okay, well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask my friends in different countries, different laboratories to repeat uh, our protocols exactly as, as we did it, because uh, following exactly is really important. They did it, they got, they confirmed his result, and they decided to submit the paper um, uh, as a, a jointly authored by those. But the response from Maddox was the same. Um, doesn't matter how many people repeat it, 
I refuse to believe it because it can't be right, because if it's right, then everybody else is wrong. Uh, and Jacques was, was advertising that it looks like water memory, um, the quote, uh, unquote, because, you know, it's, it's pure, pure water, um, essentially pure water. It's been diluted and diluted, so there are no, no molecules left, only, only water, but water that had been exposed to those molecules, so it must remember something. It must have some information from those those molecules. Um, anyway, it didn't go over well with nature, and and then um, after that, of course, Jacques was in in some some despair, uh, some anger. But the, the the homeopaths in Paris, of which there were many, uh, began to get wind of that, and and. They began thinking, my goodness, this famous scientist, uh, Jacques Benveniste, has confirmed the essence of what we do every day for patients. Um, you know, and pretty soon, um, pretty soon the people across the channel in London, nature editors, got wind of what was going on in Paris and they were under pressure. So Jacques, when I, I happened to visit uh, his laboratory, he said, I got a phone call on that phone right there from John Maddox. And he said, I'll make a deal with you. Okay, what's the deal? Well, the deal was I'll publish it uh, in Nature next week, um, but only under the condition that we can come with a group of peers uh, to look over your shoulders, see what you're doing, and then report back to our readers in, in Nature. And the people who came, um, so Jacques agreed because you know he thought, well, uh, you know, we can demonstrate this, no, no question about it. So a few weeks later, the group came, uh, the group of peers. And the group of peers um, consisted of Maddox himself, who was actually studied physics. He never quite made it to his PhD. He became a journalist and worked his way up to that um, editorial position in, in nature. That was one. The second was a guy named Walter Stewart, who um, worked at the National Institute of Health. And he was in a... Uh, a department uh, of fraud busters. You know, if you're if you're if you're working in your laboratory and you say that this black spot on the white rabbit came spontaneously, but somebody saw you sneaking into the lab and and with a paintbrush and painting it on, he's the kind of guy who so, so you know, checking uh, truth in science is his profession. So he, uh, it became clear that this group of peers was actually a, a group of people looking for some trick. Uh, and the third person uh, was the one maybe most qualified um, to find out the tricks. And that's James Randi, otherwise known as the amazing Randi, world's best magician. Um, he was one of the three peers who came. Well, are, are you tongue in cheek, or do you mean you really think he was qualified? Well, um, I think he's qualified and still is qualified. Um, uh, he, he, um, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, he's he's gifted in in terms of uh, magicianship. Uh, in other areas, I, 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 I'm I'm not so sure, but um, okay. you know, for example, uh, Yuri Geller, the the Israeli guy who claims to levitate, well. It seems that James Randi figured out the trick, so so to speak, okay. that he was using. I'm not qualified or <laughs> sure to to determine whether he was right or or not right or whatever. But he has that reputation, and um, he's um, he offered um, a prize of a million dollars for anybody who can demonstrate water memory. On the other hand, the judge is Randi himself. So well, okay. Well, I I I flatly do not accept that Randy was ever running a legitimate lab because because if if the person running the lab is going to lose a million dollars if you disprove their hypothesis, then you have bias baked into the thing from the beginning. This this is why. I have judges for my $10 million prize. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, that, that so makes... anyway, anyway, I don't want, I'm getting in the way of your story. So no, it's okay. Your story is more interesting than my story. <laughs> well, no, so, okay. So, so these guys came to his lab and then what happened? 
Well, uh, so the technician who was doing the experiments did the experiment on day one. It worked exactly as predicted. Um, and uh, day two, it was rather similar, except that the visitors uh, made it a little more complicated, but it worked. And the third day, as I understand these details, the dilutions were done by uh, the guy from NIH, Walter Stewart, and it didn't work, um, uh, even though they had reported that it doesn't work every time. Uh, and, um, and parenthetically, I, I add that um, if you don't believe the experiment is going to work, there's a higher probability that it won't work. And they gave me details on that. But at any rate, the, the deviates from the story. And the story is they went back to their hotel uh, and they uh, conferred and they decided, well, you know, it must be some kind of trick. Um, although Randy couldn't figure out the trick. There must have been yeah. some trick because, you know, when the French did it, it worked. And when the visitors did it, it didn't work. And therefore it's some trick, but they couldn't. And so they reported to nature that water memory is a delusion. Uh, they use that word delusion, uh, you know, kind of trick, even though, and they, they talked about sloppy note keeping and stuff like that. And that was the end of uh, Ben Venis's career. And um, the, the joke is, um, you know, you're getting gray, you're having uh, some problems with your memory. Well, just drink some of Ben Venice water because it's got memory. It will help you. <laughs> His career went downhill and he died prematurely. Um, uh, sadly, and you know, one doesn't know if this is related to. Um, I mean, he he transitioned from uh, a famous and respected scientist uh, to a uh, you know a joke, um, and and you can imagine the, the despair that that he felt. I actually invited him to um, to a conference that we organized on um, water and biology. Uh, this was. 17 or 18 years ago. And I think it was the first time that he had been invited since that debacle to any kind of scientific conference because, you know, he he was persona non grata. He, he was a scientific joke. Uh, very, very sad. So, so between Ben Venist and before him, uh, Der Yagen, um, uh, these two debacles took place. And the result of these debacles was that, that the field of water, which had earlier been an active field, um, especially among Russians, but among others, you know, ordinary scientists were fearful of dipping their toe into water because if these famous scientists could be dethroned uh, so easily by doing sloppy science, science uh, dealing with um, contaminants and such, w what about a, a mere mortal like myself? dissuaded people. And so the field of water basically disintegrated. Um, uh, and it's now been starting to pick up again. But, but there's a lot of skepticism in the field of anybody who finds anything that doesn't fit with the mainstream view. Well, so th this has all of the overtones of a really big discovery that people at some level are afraid to make, like especially the 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 status quo. So so I we'll need to wrap up here in the next three to five minutes. But could you speculate or tell me your opinion about um, what are the implications of this? Um, if if this turns out to be correct, if Wider really does have memory, um, what? Like, what are two or three fields that are most likely to experience a big revolution? Health is one of them. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I guess um, in, in some degree of humility, <laughs> a lot of people are, have picked this up in, uh, in, in the health field, not the mainstream by no means at all, uh, but the people dealing with uh, so-called alternative medicine, um, uh, homeopathy, for example, um, uh, um, uh, and, and such. There's a lot, a lot of interest uh, in it, and people are really beginning to pay attention. Uh, so, so that's that's definitely uh, uh, one area, and it's an area that is already picking up. Um, 
you know, I received many invitations to, uh, to speak at, at various venues, and most of them deal with some aspect of health. I think um, the field of memory, water memory, um, this is a field of the future. It, it obviously impacts water. And it's a field of the future because if it's real, um, uh, then it's critically important and nobody or almost nobody is paying attention. However, at our, at our um, I, I organize um, the annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water each year. Mm -hmm. It's in Germany. And at, at that the conference, the idea of water memory is uh, virtually everybody is, is aware of it because we get two or three presentations um, each year. Uh, that deal with water memory. And um, and one of the presenters, unfortunately, he passed last week, uh, Luc Montagnier. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, very un unfortunately. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Very, very famous guy. Yeah, a famous guy. Um, uh, I just saw a video yesterday of of his funeral, which took place last last Tuesday. And throng, there was a throng there uh, of, of people uh, I hadn't realized. Anyway, we we became good friends, and um, he came to our conference each year. And he's reporting about water memory. Um, um, his um, uh, his experiment. I I guess we probably don't have time to go into it. Uh, but if if correct, and it's been confirmed by a, another group. Um, has huge implications as do the results of other scientists using doing different experiments, but the same theme that water has memory. If water has memory, this is a revolution, um, uh, a scientific revolution. And we're, we're just at the edge of that. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, something like electromagnetism. You know, 300 years ago, someone, if you said electromagnetism, they were, what the hell are you talking about? You know, and now, it's every day we we know we understand or at least we think we understand what what's going on so so this is um if true and i the evidence so far uh, looks as though it is true it it will be a one of the important frontiers uh, of of science so that's a second area the third area that's important i think are the technological areas uh that i uh, talked about earlier during our discussion um, there's so much to be done uh, because this water, uh, if if indeed it's real, I think it's real based on the experiments we've done and other other people. Although um, there there are scientists who have raised strong objections um, to it. Um, uh, if 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 it's real, some of these technologies uh, are are going to change the world. Uh, they need development. And um, um, I'm not sure what else to say about it, but getting energy from light and water, completely renewable, basically free, uh, you know, um, and, and um, uh, getting getting in, and being able to get drinking water from ocean water. If if any of these actually <laughs> comes to work um, the way we think that. They may. Uh, th these are revolutions. So, so I've given you, um, you know, three examples of how this this could be really important, and I I'm excited about, as you could imagine, about the whole thing. And um, well, Gerald, this is very interesting, and I really salute you. That's my I gotta gotta wrap up. I really salute you uh, for your work. And if people want to look you up, what? Well, how should they look you up? What's the best uh, way? Pollocklab.org. Okay. It's, it's easy. Uh, or check Amazon for the fourth phase book. Um, the fourth that, phase of water. Yes. It's called Fourth Phase of Water. Yeah. It's become very popular. Um, well, well, Gerald, thank you very much for spending some time today. And uh, I hope people discover a really great, fascinating universe that they can go down in it. I hope that some of these end up being practical technologies that we can benefit from. So, well, thank you, Perry. I really appreciate your insightful questions and 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 your interest. Uh, uh, it's it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you.